morning, everybody. Um, part of my role this morning is um, to tell you a little bit about the nuts and bolts of the PGDIP program. If you're rethinking your career and you're rethinking um, what, um, yeah, what you're wanting to do with, with your life, um, it's really important to think about your education and to think a little bit about um, how you're going to reskill yourself for the future. And so, as I say, part of my role is to chat about the PG Dip. But I think most important before we even start is um, just to talk briefly about qualifications in South Africa in general. So, as defined by SACWA, a full qualification. Um, a full qualification is 120 credits. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but sometimes we get caught up in MDPs and EDPs and MMPs and all sorts of things, and we forget to look at the actual credits. So as I say, a minimum of 120 credits, but then you still have to check if there's a SACWA number. So um, that SACWA number, you can just pop it into Google and um, it will take you almost directly to the SACWA website uh, nine times out of 10. So if you look at uh, qualifications in South Africa, the matric is an NQF level four, and then a five, six, seven, um, at a seven, uh, we um, most commonly know that as a degree, Eight is usually an honors, and then nine is the MBA and PhD for 10. So we're on a 10 level system with matric being at four. So if you look at the diagram that's here, you will see that Henley has a five, a six, a seven, an eight, and a nine. And um, the one I'm going to be speaking about today is the PG DIP. And you'll notice there's two blocks on this level. There's the PG DIP, and then there's the PG of Africa. So they use the same curriculum, but I'm going to talk through each one uh, separately, but I'll do that a little bit later. All right, so please, um, if you know of anybody who is studying, uh, sisters, brothers, cousins, um, whoever, and um, they are looking to advance their career and they are expecting a qualification as an outcome of their studies, please make sure you ask uh, the institution for a SACWA ID number. We're convinced you're gonna study with us, but just in case, um, make sure that you check uh, because it's really important for you uh, in terms of where you spend your money. All right, so why would you want to do a PG dip? Um, perhaps it's, um, as I, say, as I said earlier, to reskill yourself. But sometimes uh, we think that that's just a piece of paper. So maybe you're wanting to go on to the MBA and you think that you're needing that as a, a stepping stone. And if that's all you're looking for when you come to Henley, I think maybe you'll be a little bit surprised because Henley's PG Dippers is a unique qualification. Um, it combines relevant and necessary content with the magic of systems thinking and action learning. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in detail just now. So learning is customized around you um, and even better, uh, you are the one doing the customization because of the way that the program is designed, because of the action learning. And not only do you, you customize your learning, but we force you to do it because there's assignments, there's projects, and you have to apply in the workplace. And that's part of what action learning actually means. So um, one of the other things, uh, well, part of what you're forced to do is you're forced to understand your context, personal, organizational, and even then further afield. Um, and it's one of the keys to your growth because uh, a better understanding of your context means that you're better able to respond to it. So we speak about job reset, and this is part of what we're talking about. We're talking about a curriculum that um, makes, heightens your awareness to your um, environment. The other thing it helps you do, the program, is understanding complexity. I mentioned systems thinking. So we give you the tools to help you um, and enable you to make sense of the tough problems that you face on a on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, to see things differently, because we get so used to um, seeing a situation and diagnosing it and coming up with a solution, 
without properly going through uh, a deeper understanding of actually what's at play. Um, so we don't break it down into small bits in analysis, but rather we sweep in complexity. We help you through tools, sweep in complexity, bring in more information instead of trying to eliminate um, and, and simplify. And then using systems thinking, make sure that you understand how the system works and how it all fits together. All right, and then another thing that the program does is it helps you understand yourself. Now you think, okay, fine, I've lived with myself since I was born, so surely I should understand myself. Sometimes that's not always the case. We're unaware of how Jahari's window, we have a blind side, we're unaware of how we come across to people, uh, both positively and negatively, and it can impact on your family, if you've got children in the house, um, it can impact you in the workplace. Um, if you don't understand how people perceive you and then have the ability to then uh, manage that perspective. So um, one of the golden threads all the way through the program and uh, Zondra is going to chat to you a little bit later. She um, looks after the personal mastery side of things for our PG to open programs. And uh, she is really passionate about leadership as well. So we don't take this lightly. So as a school, we believe that each one of us has got the responsibility uh, to contribute to the world around us day by day, conversation by conversation, every conversation. How do you do this effectively? Um, how do you become good um, or better leader? Knowledge that um, you'll certainly gain on the PD dips in spades. Um, so how do you take this knowledge and use it authentically until it becomes something that pushes you um, and inspires you? Because knowledge that doesn't inspire you is something that's going to literally remain there. Knowledge that is going to remain in a book or um, online in a document, you need something that really pushes your buttons, that really is something that that you that resonates with you. So adults learn through reflection. You may or not may know that. Um, children learn at school um, literally by rote, um, and um, there's cognitive connections, but with adults, often what we do is we test things and then we think about them and then we correct them. And so we use this all the way through the program. There's four reflective assignments across the program. Um, it's not as much an academic journey as a personal journey with very strong academic underpinnings. So it's important to note that um, the Henley PG Dip, it links theory to practice. And the PG Dip is all about practical application. So if you're expecting something that you can cram the night before, write the exam and work, walk away, it doesn't work like that. This program becomes part of you and you walk away very, very different to how you actually started on the program. All right, so um, as I said at the beginning, why are you doing this? If it's for a piece of paper, you're going to get so much more than a piece of paper. All right, um, let's talk about the nitty gritty now. Um, just very quickly, the architecture. So how does the program work? The architecture is um, uh, shown in half here. This is the first slide, there's another slide. Essentially it's six blocks over 23 days. So you'd be expected to be in the classroom. At the moment we're in Zoom, Zoom classrooms, but um, you're expected to be in the classroom for 23 days over 12 months. So it's a full qualification, 120 credits at an NQF level eight. So that's the equivalent of an honors level. So um, if you look, you'll see in the colored blocks um, are the module names um, and then the themes are noted below. And you'll notice some of the themes are pulled through to the other blocks as well. So our approach to guiding your learning is a curriculum that's integrated with a cumulative learning um, in the real world. Remember, I said you customize and you apply. And as I said as well, you get really, um, you get real personal um, growth and development out of it. The second page, you'll see um, there's the colored blocks again with the themes pulling through. And at the bottom, it says a little bit about assessment. 
So with regard to assessment, we do position papers, we do reflective papers, and we do an action learning project. There is one uh, written exam, because we do have to prepare you for the MBA, but altogether, it's a really, really amazing program. Okay, so remember um, a little while ago, um, I showed you the stairway and I said there were two programs. I'd like to tell you now a little bit about the PG of Africa. Um, the PG of Africa, we designed and implemented last year for the first time at Henley. It is completely online. It will never ever be on campus. So this is um, a variation of the normal PG dip. It's got the same syllabus as accredited um, by SACWA, but um, it is, as I say, completely, um, it's a fully blended program, which means it's online. Attendance is usually once a week for the new program starting in April. It'll probably be every Wednesday evening. Um, for just under two hours, you're expected to be online. There's also online forums that you're meant to attend as well. And then there's individual work. So for 40 weeks, you need to be um, online and um, um, working through your program. We do have a couple of weeks interspersed where there are some breaks, but uh, pretty much it's uh, on a weekly basis. So the other thing that makes this program different, apart from being not on campus, um, is the very uniquely African perspective that it actually takes. So if you could imagine yourself sitting in the middle of Africa and looking at the world of work um, uh, from that perspective and uh, seeing the world, seeing economies, seeing history and how history has impacted um, on the various countries in Africa. That's part of what makes um, this program very different. So what in history has made East and West different? What will shape the future? And uh, what are the starting points uh, from an African perspective? So a little bit about the architecture. Again, you'll see the, um, you'll see the themes um, now highlighted at the top. So you've got, sorry, the topics, modules, sorry, I'm getting there. The modules in the colored blocks, and then underneath you'll start seeing the themes. Slightly different approach to the, the normal PG dip. Here you'll see a lot more strategy, a lot more leadership, um, and Obviously, as I said earlier, the approach and the perspectives are different because they take um, the perspective uh, of, from Africa. So uh, another thing that's very different is the virtual reality component. And this is really special about the program. So you need to have um, your uh, VR viewers. And um, with those, we link it and weave it into the whole syllabus. So for example, you could step into um, the chaotic but magical uh, Gagomba market in Nairobi, and you can all but touch and smell your surroundings. And what that does is that brings case studies to life. It helps fast track um, deeper understanding of the richness of our continent. Um, and also to begin to grasp the many possibilities for the future uh, that we have. So this is the one slide. Um, I'm sure you've had a look through it. There's the second slide on the architecture where it pulls through um, those various themes. Um, throughout the program, you work through your individual African business projects. These um, help you develop a very uh, clear idea uh, sorry, a very clear business idea that you work on right from the very beginning, coming up with unique solutions. And this is presented at the end of the program as a fully fledged outcome. So I think um, both the PG DIP and the PG DIP Africa are incredible programs. I think what they help you do in a very real way is rethink your career, rethink who you are. And they also help you discover um, your passion and uh, the things that um, enthrall you and inspire you. And as Kelly said, um, it's about um, us building the people, but we're needing you to build the businesses, to build Africa. And um, studying at Henley is really, really very special across all our programs. 
Um, I'm a bit biased because I look after the PG Dips. It's an incredible program. And you'll hear a little bit later um, from uh, two faculty members as a taster in terms of uh, some of the things that we actually teach on the PG Dip. Okay, so um, in terms of um, assignments, um, there are position papers all the way through the program. Um, these position papers help you translate your, the theory that you learn during class, um, and uh, they ask you to apply in the workplace. And so one of the interesting things about um, Henley programs, we're very de democratic, you get to choose the theory you want to um, look at applying. So sometimes some theory works sometime for you, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it works at a specific time and maybe you need it later. And so position papers help you test and experiment with that theory. So you go back, you go and have a look at your own context in the workplace. Um, and so if you're an entrepreneur or you work for a, a huge organization, you do the application. And so that's what helps you translate and customize the learning. So we do position papers, number one. Number two, as I mentioned, we do reflective papers and there's four reflective papers all the way through. They're all different. They're not the same. And it's not a thumb suck of just think about what you're learning. It's very structured and it really pushes you to explore um, the reasons why you behave the way you do, why you react the way you do, and why um, you um, engage with people in, uh, in the manner in which you do. So those, those position papers, reflective paper, then the third means of assessment is a group assignment. And the group assignment on the PGDIP Africa um, is uh, in one block. And then you do an individual African business project. On the normal PGDIP, you do a group project that starts at the beginning of the pro program and you work in your syndicates all the way through and present um, your project right at the end. And those pro projects are absolutely phenomenal. We are blown away at the end of every single program. We've had two programs end in January and um, Zondre will tell you, absolutely incredible. So um, there's one other bit of assessment. We have one exam. And as I mentioned, uh, part of it is pr to prepare you for the MBA, uh, because obviously you on any MBA, you're going to be getting exams. But um, it's also a different um, a skill for yourself to be put under a different kind of pressure. Um, it's an open book exam. So you bring in whatever you want to, and um, it's a three hour long exam that happens three quarter way through your um, program. And obviously it's an integrated exam. So yes, indeed, PG Dip Africa, postgraduate diploma in management practice. Both of them are PG Dips. Both of them are full qualifications. Okay, so absolutely lead to the MBA. It's an NQF level eight, full qualification. So it's a solid step on that stairway going up. And your next step after your NQF level eight is the MBA at an NQF level nine. Great, thank you, thank you, thank you, Janet. Um, I think we've got all the questions answered. And I think it's so crucial that we are all cognizant of the NQF weights and the credits of qualifications more especially with the grade 12s that are matriculating, the results will be out shortly. And a lot of students will actually be seeking, um, you know, to study with higher institutions. And it's so important that they study with institutions that are accredited and that are registered with the Department of Higher Education. So thank you so much for that, Janet. I would also like to hand over to John Foster Pedley. Now, John is the Dean Director of Hindi Business School Africa. And just an FYI, Hindi is one of the 1% of business schools globally to be internationally triple accredited. And this is under the leadership of Mr. John Foster Pedley. Now, John is a speaker, a facilitator. He's a designer of excellent, in depth, and inspiring programs, interventions, and events. Over to you, Mr. Foster Pedley. Good morning. Hey, thank you very much, Kelly Healy. Uh, so, uh, welcome everybody. I'm I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you. As as Kelly said, I'm I'm John Foster Pedley, the Dean and Director of Henley. Been here ten years, and we've really shot up as a business school. Um, we've we've grown something like twelve hundred percent. And there's a couple of really important things about Henley you should probably understand. 
Firstly, our mission, which is we build the people who build the businesses that build Africa, is absolutely critical to us. You can tell from my voice, I wasn't born here. I was a, I'm an Englishman originally, but I've been in South Africa for 30 years and have a South African family. So I'm hugely committed to creating the future for us all. So the programs we do are not just your classic academic programs. It's really interesting. So many people in South Africa don't get a chance to get a, a really good education at uh, early years or even all the way through. In fact, only 10% of people get to have degrees and a lot of you will be in that 10%, I'm sure. There was one question from, uh, I can't see who it was. I think it was answered by Janet, yes. Uh, from about, you're still doing your degree. Can you, can you, um, can you do the, P, uh, the PG dip? Yeah, you can't do two things at once when you're studying. It's, it's against the rules. So you should either, uh, normally you would finish one and then carry on and do the other or possibly like Janet says, do the RPL. So what can I tell you about the PG dip that's really interesting? Well, firstly, all those people who are not getting opportunities to go to university, go to work. And what our ladder of program does is allow anybody at any point in their career to start getting back onto the academic sort of stairway and get those qualifications. But also, you know, undergrad study, you're studying about things. And when you get to work, you're, you're more about doing things, aren't you? Putting them into practice. So it's not all about theory. So we call our programs management practice. And that means we're producing people who are immediately better at what they do, managing problems, sorting out situations, being able to see the bigger picture, being able to talk convincingly to their peers and senior management about a business. And it's not just about the language, it's about the thinking, because you can simulate the language, but you can't simulate the thinking. What we do is help you develop that critical thinking. I think a lot of us don't feel confident about ourselves, about our intellect. You know, we, we, we kind of know we've got to be as good as anyone else, but somehow it's never been proven. Um, but the truth is, uh, if you are of normal intelligence, and normal intelligence is a good level of intelligence, you can do these programs, the postgrad diploma and the MBA. Henley is an international business school, which means that you join an alumni network that's been ranked number one in the world by the economists for potential to network. We've got about 78,000 alumni all around the world. We're the oldest business school in Europe, been in South Africa for nearly 30 years. And so when you do a Henley program, you're automatically in an international network of substance. And that really matters because um, you know that Henley programs are, are, have a standard which is international, but you also know you connected into academics, business people around the world. We've got alumni bodies and in Korea and China and Malaysia and all across Europe, Africa and many places, uh, Middle East, uh, North America. And so when I say we were ranked higher than any other business school in the world, that means any other business school you can think of. Yes, even then uh, we were ranked higher in that ranking. So we we're quite proud about that. What I think you need to think about when you get to do a PG dip is that um, you're at a stage of your career where you're starting probably to do more and more management. And we think of management as running a department or telling people what to do, whatever, but it's not. Managing is about how do you solve more and more complex challenges? How do you see a broader picture of the business? What senior managers do, they, they're always thinking about the business as a whole with all its components and trying to structure that together. So it's continually moving up and they're dealing with all the stuff that's coming up day to day that's gonna take you off track. So you need a lot of competencies. Some, some of them are not very visible when you're more junior if you're gonna move into senior level. And what this does is set you up with those capabilities that nobody can ever take away from you. Um, we, we, as an international business school at the MBA level, are, are audited by the three leading international um, accrediting bodies in the world. And only 1% of business schools have that. Uh, we're not very competitive in a business school in the terms of always trying to outdo the other business schools. In fact, we really like to collaborate and help. And we've won awards working with Gibbs and other, and other business schools, all of which are great. So you'll never hear me or anyone else knocking any other business schools. We really like them. What we do and why people come to us is because we're international. We really care. We really want people to succeed. And we really work on less 
less so much building up theory, but building management capability. So you can grow into senior managers, management, you can grow into board level, and you can feel capable to do that. Um, you, you may feel, you know, we all have something called imposter syndrome sometimes, which is like, am I good enough? And there's this little thing nattering in your ear, you know, oh, I'm not good enough. But just get used to that, please, because I'm, I'm a great believer in embracing your imposter syndrome. If you are feeling that way, yeah, just all it's saying is, is that you're pushing the boundaries of your capability. And you should have those little voices in your ears wittering away because it means you're stretching yourself. But don't listen to them. Know that you can do this. You really can. And know also that we've got some of the best support people I've ever had in my career working at Henley to help you through these things. Uh, when you do the PG dip, you can then go on and do the MBA. And there's also a discount between the PG dip and the MBA. And the MBA is an international qualification. Um, and you can graduate in the UK as well as here. So it's actually a UK qualification. So we've got a lot going for us as a business school. But the main thing we've got going for us is great staff, great students, and a great ethos. So I do hope um, that you will, you will think of it. I'm just Now, the other thing you can do is don't be polite. Um, in this and, and not ask the difficult questions. We've been doing this a long time. We love our education. We're committed to it. Um, we really want to make lots of people succeed. So ask us the questions you, you want to ask. It's not going to influence whether we accept you or not, but we like being challenged, actually, because it's, that's what you do when you become a middle and senior manager. You start challenging constructively, not negatively, but you challenge, you, 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 you rattle the cage and see what's going on because you have to get at the root of problems to solve them. Um, financially to do the program, it's um, about the same as all the other business schools at this level. Uh, it's, uh, it's an investment, but remember when you invest in your own learning, nobody can ever take it away. And it's a weird investment because a lot of other investments depreciate. But when you learn learning skills, your investment appreciates because your learning skills with practice just get better and better and you're able to deal with more competencies, more and more challenges. So we build the foundation of your learning. Um, we don't just fill you full of jargon. We build you with a really substantial foundation. How do you reflect? How do you think? How do you communicate? How do you engage people? How do you get the best effort out of people? How can you think about the whole picture and not just your thing? And, that, and if you can do all those things, you automatically become a really valuable person in the environment. And on top of that, we really talk together about what matters in life, what is a quality life. Temuko has a great skill of simplifying systems thinking and strategies. Um, he breaks it down in such a way that you are able to apply it in your everyday environment. Now, these are such big concepts and they usually make us feel so intimidated that Temuko is the one person that makes it so simple and understandable. Good morning, Devuho. Um, just to get it going, so my title today is really to say, if you want to advance your career, I fully believe that you need to know your, your own business really, really, really well. Um, and I chose this because it's, it's one of these things where, I mean, you're at a business school right now and we're talking to you as, as, as facilitators and lecturers at a business school. And a lot of people tend to, to focus on getting the paper and the qualification and the qualification being the ticket to that advancement. Qualifications are important, I, I fully agree, but I think your application of what you learn is a hundred times more important than the actual qualification. And so applying what you learn, you apply it in your business. And so if you can apply what you learn in a business that you know really, really well, uh, that qualification and the knowledge that you gain is going to help you advance in your career very, very fast. So I've got about 20, 25 minutes with you guys and, well, and then a Q&A &A, Q &A after that. Uh, it's, it's difficult to do this justice um, in terms of systems thinking and strategy, uh, but I will try my best just to give you a, a good flavor in terms of what you're talking about. So what we're gonna start with really is, is just my view in terms of navigating real world complexity. Um, link that to systems thinking and strategy and then talk about what systems thinking is and strategy and the typical approach and then we'll get into questions and answers so good let's go for it um, just as a start i'm showing you a picture on there that is quite messy right um, and i'm also showing it completely out of scale 
Um, if, if the environment is the broader economy or the broader society and the organization is where you work, you as an individual in terms of that picture, uh, by comparison, physically at least, m are much, much smaller. So just appreciate that, you know, uh, this is completely out of scale and I've done something here deliberately. Um, it is all messy. That's the first thing that you kind of need to know. Nothing is simple and everything is not as linear as we tend to think uh, and make it. And so I've made that diagram messy on purpose because that's what this is like. There's no predictability in terms of what goes on there. Um, but I also did something here. I've separated the three things out, the individual, the organization, and the environment itself. My firm belief and worldview is that all of that is one thing. You know, in terms of your professional life, you are never outside of your organization, just as your organization is never outside of the competitive landscape. It all kind of happens together at once, separately, and, and, and it's quite a... It's quite a thing to navigate and it's, it's such complexity. And if you think about, I mean, this is a static picture, right? But the one thing that creates dynamism and brings about such complexity in any particular context is time. You know, whatever your organization was last week, probably it isn't that today, but the environment has also shifted in that same period of time. What has shifted? How has it shifted relative to the organization, relative to yourself? Do you even know that? That's the complexity that we're talking about in terms of the real world. It is all one thing and time brings about the dynamism and the complexity that makes it that much more difficult to navigate. Um, and so, and I always say to people, you know, you've got to have a view of it being one, but you've got to have tools of how you're going to navigate this particular space. And compartmentalizing it is, is one of the things that, that we do talk about. Um, but I also want to highlight a few things here in terms of, at least in terms of analogies for me, you as an individual, you are absolutely critical to your organization and your application of your knowledge and everything else is fantastic. So whatever you learn at Henley is, is really, really good for you to go and apply um, in your own business. But the one thing I always remind people of is that your organization, from my point of view, is the equivalent of what I call a raging river, especially if you work for an organization that's been around for a long time, which means it's been successful for a long time. And so you've got to understand the organization, you've got to understand its DNA, you've got to understand how it got to be where it is. And, and its DNA means you have to understand what things can work in that environment, why certain things wouldn't work in a certain environment. So as you come and apply all of this knowledge, you have to apply it within the space um, that is this raging river that, that is your organization. So as part of what I tell people in terms of navigating complexity, number one, you've got to know yourself. And Zondre will speak about that because that's something that we do really, really well across Hindi programs uh, in terms of personal mastery and personal development. Um, secondly, you've got to know your business. And this is what we're going to talk about pretty much most of, of, of this time together. Uh, that is really, really key in terms of knowing your business contextually, that is, knowing its history, knowing its DNA, its culture, what makes it tick, and what are likely to be solutions that the business will absorb much better than they otherwise would if there were different types of solutions. So that is an absolutely necessary thing you need to know. And lastly, you need to know, you know your environment. And so in terms of knowing your environment, if the organization is the raging river, right? The environment itself is, is the oceans of the world. It'll swallow, oceans will swallow rivers anytime. And so you've got to pay attention to what's going on in the outside world. And it's not, it's not so much about knowing what it is, but it's about what's going on in the outside world and what is the likely impact of that in my business. And you'll only know what the likely impact on your business if you know your business in depth and really, really, really well. I mean, a lot of people talk about the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and sometimes you, you even get parliamentarians joking in parliament or trying to sound better than somebody else by asking whether a fellow MP knows what the fourth industrial revolution is. 
that's not the point. That's not what we teach you here. What we teach you here is if you, it's good to know what it is, right? Um, but you have got to understand what capabilities under the fourth industrial revolution are available to you for your organization to either serve your clients better or make your business a little bit more efficient. Those capabilities you can only truly understand if you really, really know your business. So what you select from underneath that umbrella of the fourth industrial revolution is stuff that's relevant to your business. And you can only know that if you know your business. So for me, this aspect of knowing your business is absolutely key because a big part of it, if you know your business really, really well in terms of what makes it tick, how it works, what resources it relies on, what capacities it needs, and how everything else interacts you know, together. How does your cash interact with your product cycle? How does your income come in? How do your sales go? What's a, what's the, what are the decisions around marketing that helps you bring in customers a little faster? What is the customer care side and how it retains your clients? All of that interacts and over time, all of those resources shift differently and the interconnectedness of those resources is a crucial thing that you need to understand as part of knowing your business. Because if you really do that well, what you're going to help your business with is this concept of adaptability. You will be able to react to and to absorb some change, right? If you know your, your business really well, because you will understand what leverage points and what things you need to manage in order for you to respond to some of the change and to absorb some of the change, right? I had a session with a business yesterday that was really looking at how they've come through COVID and part of their thinking around resources, particularly cash, the way they managed that meant that they came through COVID um, without having to retrench anybody, which is a fantastic thing. But without them knowing their business and how all of these different resources interact, it would have been almost impossible to adapt to the situation and then come out of it as we're coming out of lockdown. Number two, if you know your business, your ability to recover and bounce back. Because the concept of bouncing back means you knew what was there before and how you maintain that particular level. And so bouncing back to that is also a key component of you understanding your business because you have a better sense of what it's going to take to get back to where you were, right? Um, and so that's also critical. And thirdly, agility, which is about proactively sensing and redirecting where the business must go given all of the changes that are happening in the environment. And part of agility is not just about what else do we need to do, but is very much about what do we need to let go of if we're going to be agile enough in terms of the new world and what's coming at us. Now, if, you, if you've picked it up, well done. Resilience is about stability. And yet agility is asking you to be proactive and, and, and kind of move. This is a necessary dynamic tension in any business, right? You have to have stability as a business, which means you have to know your business in terms of how it works and how things get together and how you can adapt to some shocks and jolts that come through at you cyclically. But to be able to then be agile and move you need the stability first. If you're not stable, it's gonna be very difficult for you to even understand how to be agile and what things to get rid of. And for me, knowing your business is central to those three things. And there's some research out there that shows that getting resilience and agility, as well as adaptability well, we operationalize that in terms of success financially. It translates into better financial performance for your particular organization. So for you, it is absolutely important that Knowing your business and being intimate with your business and fully understanding how it works is absolutely crucial. And I always say this, especially to people who work in support functions, HR, procurement, finance, you have got to understand the core of the business because we hire you in because you're you are a competent professional. You know HR, you know finance, you know procurement. But the most successful support you know, managers that I've ever come across are people who've taken the time to know the business, and then they apply their unique skill and qualifications to that particular business. And it's absolutely essential that as you come into new businesses, if you're from especially support, support functions, take the time to learn the business and then bring your genius in terms of your speciality into that particular, into that particular business. Um, 
some of the best CFOs I've spoken to, for example, you would never think they're CFOs because they're speaking the language of the actual business. They're not speaking finance language to the general populace of the particular business or their fellow managers. You know, um, very often, you know, the, the people are the opposite of that. We'll throw in financial terms into any particular conversation. And those are the people that kind of lose us in the rest of the business because we need to hear the language of the business if we're going to get you as you're coming to us as a finance person, as an HR person, or as a procurement person, just as an example. So where does this take us in terms of systems thinking and, um, and strategy? So my view is that systems thinking is absolutely fantastic as a perspective in terms of how you view the world and how you solve problems, because systems thinking pretty much covers those three aspects, the individual in terms of mental models and how you see the world, the organizational complexity and its openness to the environment and how the two interact. Systems thinking helps you think through all of that complexity in a very organized way. It, it kind of sounds like a paradox, but when I first learned systems thinking, I thought, okay, this is some hocus pocus, but I'm telling you now, as complex as the world is and as messy as it is, if you want something that helps you to kind of bring some sense to it and organize your thought process around it. Systems thinking is the one subject for me. It's absolutely fantastic. Secondly, strategy. So strategy kind of helps you, you know, manage your organization relative to the environment. Okay. So understanding the environment and understanding your organization, those, that capability versus the environment itself and how those two must come together for you to be agile enough to survive whatever comes at you. Um, is what strategy is about. And a lot of the courses that you can learn address and cover some aspects of this dynamic environment and complexity that we're talking about. So I'm going to now get into talking about um, systems thinking itself, uh, given what I've just shared from a perspective point of view with you guys. So what is systems thinking? Um, you know, for me, systems thinking is pretty much a way of viewing the world. There's certain assumptions that you make when you're a systems thinker in terms of whatever you see happening around you. You make certain assumptions because you understand that whatever it is that you see isn't just what you see. There's a whole lot of complexity around it and there are a whole lot of underlying structural reasons why that is happening, okay? But systems thinking is this crazy idea that makes us think we can understand and tame the complexity of the world. And in my own practice, that is, that, that, that is been one of the game changers for me um, in my history within corporates. Once I learned systems thinking, I had a completely different perspective in terms of how to, how to view problems, how to look at problems and how to make a huge difference. But also understanding that whatever solutions I'd come up with could never ever be final solutions and be complete because the time factor, the organization, whatever you've done today, if it works, you've got to monitor it because as time moves along, things shift, the environment shifts, people change, the organization itself kind of, you know, changes to its next DNA evolution or whatever you want to call it. So systems thinking though is very, very useful in terms of you kind of getting a better sense of that particular complexity. So a couple of quotations that I've got there, but that's the idea behind systems thinking. And a lot of people talk about VUCA, you know, this whole story about the world being volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. That's what the world has always been. The world is, is kind of, has always been non-linear, which is the VUCA side of things. Uh, it's agnostic about our endeavors as human beings. A lot of the time we think that, you know, nature is meant to revolve around us. That's not true. But our thinking about it, which is on the right-hand side of that particular slide, is really we think that everything is human-centered when it's not, okay? The real world is adaptive and organic, but we tend to think about it mechanistically. Um, and then the real world is networked and complex, but we tend to think in a very linear way and having things ordered and categorized and, and, and you know, having hierarchies. I mean, I, I've got a science background and the way I was taught was to break things up and then start to solve them in individually, right? And systems thinking kind of makes you realize that you would be a better analyst if you first understood why. 
the system is, is in place to start with. And then you can analyze the different parts already with the idea of where it fits in to the bigger system and the bigger purpose and all of those different things. So here's the challenge with the world is that the real world is complex, it's volatile, it's all of these things that are on the left-hand side of this particular slide. But our typical thinking and how we're brought up is very, very linear. It's very human-centered and it's very mechanistic, right? And so we live in this world and yet we think in a way that for me is completely opposite of what the actual world looks like. And so what I've found with systems thinking is that system thinking is an attempt to resolve this mismatch that I'm talking about here. Because we've got this very, very complex world and yet our thinking doesn't even try to match that. We still think in very linear terms and yet everything is kind of circular and there's feedback everywhere and things move along and there's a dynamism that cannot be sorted out by ordered thinking and categorized thinking, right? It's a bit of a mess, but systems thinking tries to help us to resolve this mismatch. And something that's very popular as an analogy of, of how you view the world as a systems thinker is the iceberg model, which I'm gonna share with you guys now. So as a systems thinker, you know, when you see something happening, right? We already assume that what you are seeing is just the tip of the iceberg. Okay, hope that makes sense. Tip of the iceberg means that there's a whole lot of stuff beneath the surface that is behind or under what we're actually seeing at the top. An example that we've got in this particular iceberg is that you, you're catching a cold, right? That's what we see, we're seeing the sniffles, um, you're feeling some kind of way and everything else. But with systems thinking, we say, you know, you need to do more than just react, okay? So whatever's happening in your organization at the moment, yes, you can react. So if I've got a cold, I can go buy cold medicine or I can do, you know, make up some remedy at home. And that's a reaction though, right? As a systems thinker, you've got to understand that you need to go a little bit deeper if you're going to have a long-term sustainable impact and maybe diagnosing things in a better way, right? And the first thing when you start to investigate beneath the surface of the water is that you go back in time, right? To try and understand, but what's been happening over that period? Is there any, do we have any sense of a pattern in terms of what's been happening? And if we're talking about this particular person around this cold, what you're saying is, hey, hang on, but I've been catching more colds when I've been sleeping less, right? So it looks like there's a pattern whenever I, don't get enough hours sleep. I tend to catch colds easily. And, and so that's been happening over a period. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, so next time I start to sleep, you know, a little bit less or a little bit fewer hours, I almost can surely anticipate with some level of confidence that I'm likely to get a cold. Can you see that even as a manager, you're, you're a little bit better off than just reacting, right? Above the surface, nothing wrong with reacting but you've got to couple it with a deeper understanding in terms of whatever you're reacting to. Um, if you can identify a pattern, at least you can then prepare for those reactions as time goes along. That's the one level just beneath the surface of the water. But we always encourage people to fully go deeper as systems thinkers, right? So in terms of understanding what influences the patterns, right? Why do I sleep less? Why do I do all of these different things? Why do I, knowing that, you know, a sleeping pattern like this leads to colds, but why, why does this happen? What, what, how do I get here? And then if you go deeper, you'd like to find out there's a whole lot of things that contribute to you sleeping less. More stress at work, not eating well, difficulty accessing healthy foods near home or work, or whatever it is, right? There'll be a combination of things that are unique to your own environment or to your own person. And that's the other thing with systems thinking is, you know, I, I'm all for best practice. I always tell people best practice is, is, is one of the best things, but best practice on its own, without it being adapted to your own context, your own organization, knowledge of your own business, best practice is going to be a problem for you. There's a whole lot of people that go out into the world, see something they like, and they bring back into the organization and say, this is going to work because it worked in Sweden. 
And then they're surprised when it fails. Nine times out of 10, things that are acontextualist solutions are not useful for any particular environment. So you've got to have an appreciation of what's been going on in your space and what makes your space tick before you go applying some form of best practice. So in terms of underlying structures, once you get to that level, you can influence things at what we call the design level. At a structural level, you start to, if you can make changes there, you're likely to make more sustainable changes and we'll see less and less cold above the, above the water, if that makes sense in terms of the iceberg. Now, you know, deeper than the design itself is, is how we view the world and the mental models and the belief systems that get us into these types of things in the first place. And so if you think about this idea of stress at work and everything else, you know, what must the world be like for us to let work stress us as much, right? Okay, a worldview that talks about the career. My career is the most important piece, you know, in this entire thing. So I define myself in terms of my career, so I will kill myself for my career, right? That's a particular worldview that would justify people stressing themselves and killing themselves and not sleeping because of work and all of these different things. And there'll be other perspectives that, that might influence that. And when you talk mental models, that is something that you as a person and at Henley, we encourage you to do reflective practice because you've got to understand who you are, why you are that way and why you have the beliefs that you have, right? And you've got to work on those. It's a lifelong journey for you to work on your mental models. And that's a very individual thing. And it takes time and it takes understanding, it takes being open, it takes being vulnerable and, and, and being insecure, right? Because one of the things we do is when, when we're faced with you know, vulnerability, people close up. But if you're gonna work on yourself at this particular level, you've got to be open to being vulnerable and you've got to be open to being reflective and truly reflective and that's important. So just systems thinking, um, so that's how we look at it from a systems thinking point of view. And what we would do is we'll teach you a systematic way of getting from the top above the water right down to working on those underlying structures so you can have a lasting impact in your business in terms of shifting things along and getting the business instead of continuing to react all the time to something that keeps popping up, helping to move it along um, to something that's much more stable but also it gives you time to then start working on some of the more systemic stuff and some of the more structural stuff, especially as a senior manager um, in your particular space. So that's systems thinking. Now with strategy, um, there's a definition that I like in terms of strategy, which says an organization strategy is how it tries to reach its objectives. Very simple, but I like this definition largely because in a lot of people's minds, in society, in some of the talk, in, in even some, you know, some respected magazine articles, there is this view that strategy is separate from the doing, okay? People think, and people think that strategists or strategists are better than the operations people. We're the thinkers, you're the doers. My view is that strategy and execution are two sides of the same stick, okay? If you're really going to be impactful in your organization, those two things have to move together in alignment, okay? You cannot go to a strategy session in the bush and, you know, come back to the workplace and you go back to what I call normal, right? You absolutely have to take whatever you're discussing in the bush in terms of strategy and coming up with all these plans and you've got to translate that into actions in the environment, on the floor, and you've got to bring your people along in terms of doing that. So if you, there's even, there's even talk of, you know, what would you choose? A great strategy and a B team to implement that strategy or uh, a secondary strategy and an A team to implement that particular strategy. And I always say to me, that's a false choice, right? Because those two things go hand in hand and it's a fallacy from my point of view to see them as separate it creates this artificial boundary that isn't there. The doing is a key part of the strategy and so is the thinking and so is the planning and everything else. And if you are going to do and do well, you've got to know your business really, really well. And you've got to understand what parts of the business the strategy actually affects on your particular side. 
Um, so there's three main tasks around strategy, really. Um, positioning the organization relative to other organizations. So who are you, what are you doing, and how are you going to be different, and how are you going to differentiate yourself to the rest of the market? Um, choosing objectives for the organization. That's a big thing. It's actually quite a skill to choose objectives for your particular organization. And three, it's steering the organization's progress over time. Research has kind of shown that positioning is probably responsible for about just less than 20% of your, of your profitability and returns. And 80% of your profitability and your returns is due largely to steering the organization's progress over time. That's the experience management team. That's the execution. That's how you, you see things through from plan to the floor. And this is how you convert things into action. So steering the organization is what creates outside performance, outside performance in any particular sector. It is the work that the senior management team together with everybody in the organization do in trying to attain their objectives and their goals. That's what, that's what, that's a big thing around strategy in terms of what we do. So those are the big tasks and much like with systems thinking, there's key questions that you can ask with strategies. You must answer these questions if you're going to be a good strategist and, and there must be around performance. Whatever your performance matrix is that you're looking at, right? If you're gonna come up with a strategy going forward, you first have to understand number one, why has past performance followed this particular time path as a business? You can only answer that if you know your business intimately, if you get real data, real evidence in terms of what's been happening. And I always encourage people that when you see data like this, it's always good to start at the inflection point. Whatever things turn, go back and find out what happened here. Uh, what was happening? Why did this particular performance metric shoot up? Why did it drop all of a sudden? What was happening? That's Context, that's understanding. It helps you build your own knowledge around the business. A lot of people discount history, you want to come into an organization and just want to get going. Let's, let's, let's get going. A proper contextual understanding of how your performance has been over time is absolutely crucial for you as a strategist in terms of mapping a particular way forward. Number two, if we don't change anything, where is future performance likely to go? You've got to have a sense of being able to forecast, being able to see where you're likely to go if things carry on as they are. And number three, how can we improve future performance, which is that green dotted line that goes up. And part of strategy is all those three questions are critical. And then you start to answer how you're going to do better than you would if you do absolutely nothing. And as we teach you strategy, we teach you tools that help you analyze your internal capability that help you analyze the outside world in terms of how it's likely to impact um, what you're trying to do. And then give you tools to help you craft plans that will help you navigate your view of that particular future and some of the things that you might um, see as either opportunities that you need to take advantage of or as threats to your particular objectives in terms of where you wanna be in three, four, five, six, seven, eight years um, as a business. So those are three, specific questions that we always encourage that you, you answer as a strategist. Now, I've talked strategy, I've talked um, uh, systems thinking, and you know that's just a flavor of some of the stuff that we typically go through and take you through as a student to make sure that you are better and better at, number one, looking at the organization and thinking about it in a way that respects its complexity. And that's where systems thinking comes in. And number two, with strategy, you know, the key thing around steering the organization, give you the tools to be able to answer these questions and drive your organization forward. But all of it is absolutely connected. And central to that is you as a manager or as an aspirant manager, knowing your business really, really well. Because to navigate this complexity is no, is no kid's play. Um, you really, really have to apply yourself. You really, and, and it's fun. You know, when you respect your environment and you, and, you, and you respect that it's complex, applying these tools is actually fun, right? Because you're learning all the time if you're open to the learning. People sometimes tend to think that if I come up with this solution, uh, it's going to be the greatest thing ever, right? And, and so shall it forever be. Life moves on, the environment moves on, everything is dynamic. And so you've got to be committed to learning. Um, and that's the beauty of this thing.
you learn even beyond Hindi. Because once you get that mindset of always being looking out and learning, and that's what we teach you, is this thinking skills that allow you to remain relevant in, in this complexity uh, better than most people. Um, if we can do that for you, Henley is the place to be. I really, really believe that. And I've been engaging Henley. I've been facilitating at Henley for about four or five years now, and it's been absolutely fantastic. So that is it from my side. Um, in terms of this, uh, what do we call it? Teaser. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tomoko. That was phenomenal. Um, mm. We've got a question here from Mamo who says, um, this is quite eye-opening. Is systems thinking similar to social construction theory in that no outlook, perspective, or decision is incorrect, provided that you argue or substantiate it? Oh, okay. So I don't know the term itself, social constructivism, yeah. um, but yeah. No, we, I mean, my perspective is really around this thing is all one, right? We're all in our context. We live in there. We're never outside of it. Um, and so if that's equivalent to, to what uh, social constructivism is, then yeah, I guess that's it. I don't Thank know. Thank you, Tebuho. Great. Thank you, Tebuho. And we would like to then go on to our next speaker, Dr. Dr. Zondre Kivi. Zondre has a PhD in leadership. She specializes in the field of leadership development, leadership performance, organizational health and culture. She's an adjunct faculty member who holds up the role of program director within the, pro within the PG DIP programs. She also consults within the retail, health and mining sector. Her warm nature truly makes you feel at ease. As a program director, her main role is to up Hold the academic rigor of the program and to also ensure that you as the individual are catered and taken care of throughout this learning journey. Sandre, good morning. Hello Kelly, hi guys. What an honor and how cool it is to be able to spend this time with you. Um, I'm really hoping we have fruits in this, in this short time that we have together and it's such a special space. I think it's really important to acknowledge that our dear Kelly in front of you is a PGD graduate. So you make me so proud, Kelly, when you, I mean, the way you show up and your confidence and the way you're hosting this session is really just inspiring. And I just want to acknowledge that you've been through this journey so you can really speak, speak firsthand about it. So I'm um, very proud. Thanks, Kelly, for the introduction. So guys, my name is Zondre and I am into, into humans. And I'm particularly interested in, um, sure, living your full life, um, being the best version of yourself. I am very, very concerned or very, very obsessed with, um, we spend so much time at work um, and the environment that we, that we spend that time in has got to be healthy and it's got to be well. And one of the main conduits of that healthy organization or healthy space is the, is, the, is the role of the leader. And so the lens that I always take is, is human first and humanity in leadership is just so, so um, necessary at the moment. And I'd like to share with you some, some research that's, that's um, quite relevant now, something that's close to my heart. And, um, but before I start that, I was thinking last night, you know, I have family members that have done the PG DIP. My um, fiance is currently doing the Henley MBA. So it's really vested. I really am passionate about this. I really want to speak from the heart and I want to um, not convince you, but I really want to, you know, it, you know, show you that this is a significant process and a really significant um, qualification. And when I was thinking last night, you know, I'd like, you know, how will this PG DIP serve you? Serve you as a person, serve you as a student going forward, serve you as someone in the workplace. I really kind of summarize it into see six key uh, principles or, or tenants that hold this program together. And I'd like to, you know, kind of share them with you. The first principle is really that the quality of everything we do depends first on the quality of the thinking we do first. And the PG DIP is profound in that because it enables you to think with a different lens and think with multiple lenses and to, um, you know, assess that the quality of my thinking is, is not robust enough. So, and that changes everything. That's really a game changer. 
The second really um, pivotal thing is the whole PGW design. The process is really about interrogating. And with the interrogation, you're drilling down to the root cause in systems thinking. You, you, you Interrogation is, but why? How is this happening? What are the, the influences? What are the variables driving this? And in your interrogation, especially in your um, when you when you answer your, your position papers, the interrogation allows you to um, format or start putting together a good argument. And a really important thing for leaders is be, is be able to listen and be able to respond, but also be able to have a sound argument. And I think that goes a long way to be influential is if your argument makes sense, if your argument resonates with people. The second thing is about reflection and wow, is that not a superpower? So reflecting is um, the ability to have perspective on something and to understand how you show up um, in that space. And once you've interrogated and you reflected, um, you then be able to explore options and options, you know, better decision making options or alternative options. Um, and that's often exploration with, is where the innovation and the creativity, um, you know, stem from. The next key tenant of this program, I think that will really serve anyone is the fact that, um, as Tabojo, his talk was on this, is understanding the interconnectivity and the causality of systems. Everything depends on everything. Everything is influenced by everything. Um, I always, you know, the analogy I, 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 I say to people is, if you had, if you chop my heart out and you put it on the side, you know, on the side table next to me, would my, does my body function and does, the, does my heart have any value? And it's only because my heart is in my body that it has value. And in the business world and indeed in life, everything is, is, is super connected and everything impacts everything. And if you, if you think a certain way, it impacts the system. If you react a certain way, it impacts the system. So there's that, um, that duality, duality or connectivity that's always present in complex issues. Something else that really will stand you in good stead to do this qualification is the thinking that I'm at the center of every system. So, um, you know, that cliche, everything starts with me. That is indeed um, a, a really strong learning that you'll take from the program. And that is where the reflection, the reflection is powerful, is how am I influencing the system and what is happening inside of me? What is impacting the way I show up? What is impacting my fear? What are my defense mechanisms? What are my biases? Um, why can I tolerate this person? How do I show up in stress? Um, why am I uncomfortable in, in this kind of conflict? Those are those are really good lessons to to learn in life, and not only you know you know not only as a student but for, for life practice. Um, another really important thing is, and this is my my complete um, ikigai. This is my reason for being is understanding that we grow the whole person to grow the leader, and there is something about leaders that are that is profound when they show up and there's a fullness in understanding self. There's a there's a strength that they show there's a kind of, um, if you're strong inside, you can be vulnerable. If you're strong inside, you can take critique. So often when you get to a senior position, you've had all the technical skills and all the specialist skills. And I agree that's important, but often we neglect to fill the human. And the human is where the personal mastery module would really kick in, is what makes me, me. What is what is my story? What is the story behind my story? And that is that, that is profound learning. And then the last key principle, the entire qualification, you know, these are like summaries I'd like I'm presenting to you now, is that leadership is made up of um, you know, thinking is really important to be critical, to be robust, to have an argument. But leadership is also measured in doing the execution. And then let's not forget leadership is also about being. So um, the being is, is who am I as a human? Because who is I'm a hum as a human will really influence me as a leader and how I show up. So that's just, you know, kind of in a nutshell, if I had to think back on, on the PG Dip journey and I, and I see students all the time and they give me feedback, these are the kind of things that stick. And especially when they go into the MBA, they go, wow, I understand why that was in the course now, because it's really serving me, really serving me in the MBA. So that's just, you know, I wanted to, you know, use that as an introduction. So um, 
Yeah, so Deboho was talking about mental models, um, about the iceberg, and so I'm just positioning it in another way, is that, you know, after the program, you have multiple lenses. And the more lenses you've got, the healthier it is, because you have perspective. And the more perspective you have, the more inclusive you can be, and the more, um, you know, the, the wider you can think. And that's really, that's really important. And of course, how do I see the world? Do I see the world as it really is? Or do I see the world as I want it to be? And, you know, when we speak, speak about people with myopic view, one of the seven sins of leadership is myopic view, um, short-sightedness. Um, and I'm sure you know what it feels like to work for someone who's extremely short-sighted. It's very frustra frustrating because they can't see the big picture. And of course, not only how do I see the world, but how do I see, see myself in the world? And how do I take my place in the world? And how do I own my voice? And how do I show up with, um, with power and with kindness? But how do I show up in my fullness? And that's really important to live, to live a significant life is to be, you know, use all your talents that you've got and use all the abilities that you've got to, to spend this time on, on earth in, in the most profound way. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about something, you know, that's topical at the moment. So if you look at our lives right now, it is, People say that, you know, when I ask them how they're doing, they go, everything's okay, but everything is not okay. So we don't have language to use to explain how we're feeling at the moment. Um, but the current, you know, perhaps things that I have picked up with is the current context is our current context is overwhelmed by people feeling anxious and afraid, lonely, disconnected. Certainly questions about relevance, you know, like what, what am I doing? Is this how it's going to be forever? And I was interested to find that there's a, there's a thing called, so we're feeling fatigue, but there's actually a thing called COVID tired. So people are, you know, waking up tired, even after a, a break or after a holiday. And that's just interesting um, to me too, because I can, I can almost identify with that COVID tired. So when you look at this context, um, there's definitely a call for leadership um, to show up in a way that we haven't, maybe we have forgotten about, or maybe it's taken the back seat because we've been focusing on other things. And so I'd like to position um, two concepts about the currency of wellness is connection, and perhaps that relationships are the new world currency in this context for leaders, for leaders right now. And that just brings me to talk about the fact that, you know, I think we need to stop and think and now as leaders, what, what is needed, and I'm acknowledging that artificial intelligence, machine learning, innovation, strategy, all those things are important, and they will remain important. But right now, I think that, you know, there's a call for, for a different um, emphasis of how we show up as leaders. And I want to just say that, you know, we are human before anything else. And in this ultra-connected world, we are less connected than ever. And um, I like to think of leadership leaders act like the light switch in organizations when leaders are positive and and um kind and influential the light switch the, there's light in the organization but when leaders are negative and toxic and cruel and manipulative um there is darkness in the organization so right now i think there is a call for leadership that is based on respect for humanity um, leadership that is profoundly ground, grounded in the realities of other people. They really understand what other people are going, for, are going through. And of course, leadership that is now driven by the desire to connect on a real human level and not, you know, not to be seen as a Zoom number or a Zoom code or someone that is an email a reference, but someone who can really connect with people as humans. I think that is the call for, for this context right now. And, you know, especially in the African context, especially in South Africa and Africa, we have a, we have a thing about relationships. It's, it's uh, the way that we live and the way that we understand the world. Um, we really need that connection more than any, any other place because um, that is grounded in our DNA. That is our currency. That is how we understand wealth and you know, it's how many people we've got with us and how many connections we've got and how many people are really there for us when, when, things, are, when things are tough. So 
Um, having said that, you know, there's talk about, um, you know, if you look at some, some of the latest uh, published articles, there's talk about um, that relationships are the new world currency. And um, sure, I went on a, on, a, on a masterclass in December and I really had, a, you know, received real, real insight then. I'd like to share that with you. Um, so first of all, sort of like the thinking that without relationships, there's no, with, there's no success. And without success, there's no sustainability. And relationships are powerful because they teach us or they serve, serve us with three functions. Relationships are helping help us to learn, to unlearn or to relearn. Or another way of saying this is that relationships teach us about giving, gaining or growing. And I thought that was profound because in relationships, you learn the life skills of what's acceptable, what's not, how to push boundaries, how to deal with conflict. And um, relationships teach you the subtleties of, you know, of, of life as well, how to negotiate, um, you know, office politics, um, how you show up, maybe, you know, how arrogance um, affects people's reactions to you. So relationships are a profound learning space. And we also speak about the four R's and um, the first R is reflection and reflection will give you insight and foresight. However, you've got to be prepared to be authentic and vulnerable. You've got to be pre prepared to go there. And when you reflect, it helps you get ready. And the more ready you are, the more you show relevance or the more relevance you have. And relationships hold that. Relationships help you reflect on how you're doing. It's almost like a barometer. They help you get ready or help you change the way you show up. And relationships will also help you sustain re relevance because every time you're in a, re a new relationship, you have to bring the skills. You have to change the way you do things if the relationship's not working. So it's almost like a, like a container for, for continuous and significant learning. And I just thought that that take on relationships was really significant now, especially in, in the lens that I say that leaders need to show humanness more than anything now and more than that, more than they ever have. Um, so traditionally, maybe um, archetypal codes and organizations, things that were never focused on were empathy and kindness. And so that really struck me um, and I was blown away by, by the issue of kindness. And I started looking at kindness from a, from a neuroscience or a science perspective. And I'd like to share with you 10 interesting things about the science of kindness. So yes, kindness is a real thing and it has far reaching impact on people and how they feel. So the first thing I thought was interesting was that kindness produces endorphins did you guys know that and endorphins reduce pain so the, so we say that kindness is almost like a natural painkiller pain i thought that was fascinating um kind people have less cortisol and cortisol is the stress hormone so kind people also experience less stress um other things that kindness will decrease anxiety um, social, social kind of nerves, or, you know, if you're shy to, to show up in a social space, it will decrease that fear. Also decreases sadness and depression. Um, being kind or doing acts of kindness releases oxytocin, and that lowers the blood, your, your blood pressure. And so this is actually known as a cardioprotective hormone. So it's really good heart health. Um, kindness is also teachable. Um, and when I say that is you can really, people are able to build up their compassion muscle. So the more you practice, the more you're able to do it. And it's like anything, you know, it's an ability. Um, kindness is contagious. Um, when you are participating in acts of kindness, um, your mood improves. And when your mood improves, there's a significant likelihood that you'll pay it forward. Um, kindness, the oxytocin um, does things like increase your self-esteem, um, elevate your level of optimism, works or, or creates a, a better sense of self-worth. Um, oh yeah, when you are a kind person, um, it actually lights up the brain's pleasure centers. It's called the helper's high. So that's why you feel so good about yourself. And of course, um, 
serotonin is um, a chemical produced by by when you're involved in kind acts and it's a feel good chemical so you feel happier you feel calmer you just feel better about yourself and then the most significant thing the wow factor for me is that we were all born kind so like let's remember that again and what happened to that kindness that we were all born with so that just you know that resonates with me um, in a very clear way so yeah the the call for leadership now to be human to be authentic to be real to be kind to be warm and to really get out and connect with people and make them feel safe is is what i think there is a is a profound need for so you know a shift from using kindness having this empathy but showing it in the care you know it's a different story talking about empathy and understanding you know how it works but like i mean practice it with your voice with your eyes um with your time and, and you know um really make people feel significant because i think that we're all feeling a bit lost i haven't seen a student for 10 months I, I, that's my thing. I need humans. So I'm just relating it to, to, the, to the fact that um, human, human before anything else. So there is a little technique that perhaps I want to share with you today about how we could incorporate um, the principle of appreciation and gratitude and kindness and also care. Um, and it's a, it's a clever tool because it allows you sometimes to combine these things. And um, it's called languages of appreciation or some people call it the MBA, manage, Managing by Appreciation. It's the concept that, as in all humans, we have got different ways that we respond to. And um, when you want to recognize or connect or appreciate with someone, you have to speak their language. Um, now, as human beings, what we do is, I have a language, that's my preference, and I automatically will do it to you, but the problem is that it might not be your language. So as I do it, and the more I do it, it doesn't connect with you because it doesn't, it doesn't resonate with you because it's not your primary language of appreciation. So as you can see, there are five languages of appreciation. And um, just to give you some context, things are quite hectic out there in terms of the current stats about how people feel about being recognized and appreciated and noticed at work. And I mean, um, these stats are abound. You can Google them. There are many Gallup studies and, you know, all the time reports are being written about how people feel about the lack of appreciation. And I really don't want to query the stats because they're lots, but, you know, 75 or lots of people say they would leave their current job for a job that had recognition and appreciation as part of, as part of the deal. Um, many people, 70 people say that they would work harder, they would be more there, they would be more engaged if they um, felt appreciated. Um, and if you are appreciated, you really will stay, you really want to stay in that job, and you really have no desire to leave. And um, that just kind of is an aha moment that 1% of appreciation gives you 100 you know, 100 units of motivation. So if it's really to work smarter and not harder um, if, if, the, if you're looking at the bottom line and from a business, business decision. So as I said earlier, I think I might be repeating myself now. There are different ways to, um, to show appreciation or different languages. We all have a unique preference. Um, we will value a certain language more than more than other languages. And in fact, if you are appreciated in your least favorite language, it won't even come across as a validation or, or, or some kind of recognition or appreciation. So while everyone is completing the questionnaire, um, you touched on personal mastery. And I think, you know, it is such a difficult topic for people to address. And, you know, I think people make better sense of systems thinking because you apply it to the organization and to the business. But with personal mastery, you need to go within and you need to apply it to yourself and you need to be raw and you need to be vulnerable. And how, how, can, how can people, you know, lean into personal mastery a little bit more? So, you know, it's about, you, you take the decision about being brave. And, you know, um, John spoke about that fear and that imposter syndrome. Those are good things. Because mm. if you work with that, you go to the next level. Your other option is to just pretend it's not there. Um, and so more and more when you face challenges, complexity, conflict, pressure, you are relying on your EQ to get you through that, not your IQ. 
So your IQ or your threshold skills, they'll get you there. But the thing that makes you sustainable is your ability to um, work with nuance and to work with humans. And so, I mean, people often say it's not my strategy that got me into trouble. It was my ability to deal with the people that had to be doing the strategy. That was the tough part for me. And I mm. suppose you practice humaneness and understanding humans on yourself. So if you are going to practice respect or show someone respect, you first you can't show someone else respect if you haven't done it yourself. You haven't practiced in yourself. So it, I mean, it's 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 uh, often people say that you know it's unpleasant. I don't want to talk about that stuff. I don't want to go there. I would rather just you know it's easier to focus on you, Kelly. This is what I think you should do. This is how you, I think you could change. So yes, it's deep work. It's hard work. That's where that interrogation that I spoke about earlier that interrogation and that, um, that reflection on why. And that's not an easy question to, to answer. And I, I must be honest with you, I know senior leaders that um, have gone their whole life without it and at the age that they are, they probably never will. You know what I mean? So it is also a choice about I'm, I'm willing to go there and I want to, I want to um, you know, understand those things, but it has profound implications. Absolutely. I see we're starting to get some comments in from Sulile, Faith, Terence. That's beautiful. We're getting some responses in. And this is a lovely little activity to do with your teams, um, just to kind of connect with them and, you know, have a talk about that you realize or that appreciation is important, but maybe the acknowledgement that everyone wants to be recognized in, in a unique way. And I think this also just gives the, the, our guests a feel of how interactive our classes are. You know, um, as much as we are running online, we keep our classes as interactive as possible. So you have activities in the classroom. There'll be chat, um, um, chats that you need to interact with. There'll be breakaways that you are put away into for you to have um, team discussions. So as much as we are online, we also do promote connectivity as much as possible. And your engagement is completely crucial, not only to your learning journey, but to the rest of the class. Absolutely. You learn so much from the people in, in the class. Almost, I want to say more, because you've got all those brains to tap into, all that experience, all that wisdom, all the different perspectives. Um, I've got a nice little uh, joke of, or the saying about perspectives is, that you have a husband and a wife. Um, the husband is a policeman and the wife is a nurse and they work in you know, the hospital and the police station are quite close to each other in the village and they drive to work and back every day together and they park you know, in the garage and the one goes to the nurse to the hospital and the husband goes to the police station. And one, one night they're driving back from work, it's dusk, the sun is kind of setting. And um, as they're driving home, they, they, they see a man lying in a ditch and so my question to you is when the husband who's a policeman gets up, what does he think about the, you know, what does he think? What is his immediate reaction when he sees someone in a ditch, lying in a ditch, like curled up? Um, I would think um, he's, he's drunk. Yeah, I don't drunk. know. He's done something wrong. Like oh, exactly. And what is the, the nurse as a wife? She steps out of the car. What, is, what does she think when she sees someone lying in the ditch? I think my first instinct, if I was a nurse, I'd think um, he's, he's, he's hurt and I definitely need to help him. Absolutely. So, you know, two people that live together, drive together to work for 40 years, look at their different perspective. Mm. They have a completely different perspective. Absolutely. We spoke about these five languages of appreciation in the workplace. Quickly, quickly, can I go through them with you? Um, I know that we have got five minutes left. Um, so... By the way, I, I wish I could have a show of hands. Whose combination is um, number one, words of affirmation and two, quality time. That's quite a strong profile. And then um, words of affirmation and acts of service is also quite a strong profile. So words of affirmation, it, people that respond to words of affirmation, when you um, appreciate them, the, these are the things to keep in mind. Um, you have to use the person's name you have to assess the quality of the words, the exactness of the words, and it's the acknowledgement of um, what they did, but also why the act was significant. 
So they will, might respond to, well done, Kelly. You finished the job on time. And because you finished the job on time, we can all go home early. So when you, the words of affirmation is about indicating the act, but why the act was valuable. And words of affirmation um, would be effective vocally, talking to them, or in writing. It would still count as, as um, a significant um, appreciation or validation. Things not to do or general praise, like, hey, guys, well done. Um, and, you know, it's a general statement. So the, re the quality is on what they did, why it was significant, and how it perhaps helped the group or saved, or saved the organization time or money or why it was significant. Um, the, the next language of appreciation is quality time. And this is not talking. Quality time is ritualized behavior. Quality time is that come hello, how water you spend the, a certain um, patterned time with someone. And you might not say a word in that, in that 10 minutes. It's just that you're with that person fully and present. So things not to do is do not take your cell phone. Don't wave and talk to other people and don't you know, be on your WhatsApp. It's the time, it's almost sacred time. And they respond to the fact that every Tuesday at three o'clock, we walk to the garden to have a smoke together. So it's not about the dialogue, dialogue necessarily. It's about the uninterrupted time. It's a symbol of our thing together. And it's, and it really builds on the consistency of it. That it happens over and over again. It, that it is a ritualized behavior. Acts of service people are people, it's also not a, not a talking one, but more doing one. And people that respond to acts of service appreciate the feeling that you're getting involved, that you're taking a load off, that you're participating. So if you help pack a box, if you help merchandise um, products on, on a shelf, if you help do filing, um, they feel a sense of camaraderie that really responds to them, that you've got down and dirty and you're doing it with them. But not what not to do is don't do it for them and, you know, don't take over. And um, they will guide, you know, they're still the leader in the doing and you just support. And they feel held and they feel safe and they really feel like there's a commitment and it really responds to, to them. Guys, so um, I share with you my two languages of appreciation are the last two, receiving gifts and physical touch, but they really are not, you know, the, the words don't do this justice. This is so misunderstood. So people that respond to receiving gifts, it's not about buying the person a present. People that are receiving gifts, people are nostalgic. They are sentimental. They... Um, treasure the memento and the symbol of something. So if you go on a conference overseas and you bring them the brochure of the, confer of the conference, um, they keep that conference brochure and to them it's symbolic of, you thought of me in that time, it's the thing that we share together, it's our special thing. So it is not about the value of the gift or the value or a monetary thing, it's about, it is a nostalgic memento. So, I mean, if I just show you on my desk at home, um, when I was 15, someone made me a card that was a puzzle. Um, 200 years ago, I was a student at UJ and they gave you this little, little man as, a, you know, as an entry gift. And, and tangible gift people keep these because of the memory and the symbol and the specialness and the memento, it's not the value. And a warning, when, if you have someone who's a receiving gifts person, do not take their stuff away. Um, a friend always told me, you know, that uh, she's got this colleague that um, is obviously a gifts person um, and someone gave her a little packet of fudge and she keeps this fudge on her desk, doesn't open, it's got dust on it already. And one day so she was on leave and someone came past and was starving and so just opened the fudge and had a block of the fudge. And when this lady came back to work, she was absolutely, you know, cross. And the guy said, I'll buy you new fudge. She has a new exact same fudge from Woolworths. And she said, no, thank you. You don't understand. You know, it's, so it's about the memento and the nostalgia and the connection you had with that person. Um, it's certainly not about, about the monetary value. And then to be true to this, you can't, most of the profiles don't even include the fifth one, but, you know, it is, it is an actual thing. Some people respond to physical touch. And I know this is controversial. I'm not advocating touching people at work. But the truth is that some people place more value on a physical gesture. 
And so they feel validated, they feel recognized, they feel connected when you, you know, do an appropriate gesture of touch, a handshake, a, a arm, you know, hand on the arm, and most, you know, the worst, you know, or the best case scenario, a hug. Um, and yeah, so I said that, that that is my language. So it's much more meaningful for me to get someone even to sit close to me. I feel, you know, that's more important than someone writing a whole letter of praise, for example. So, it, you know, the message is everyone is different. And as a leader, you can really make a difference by connecting with someone in their language of appreciation. And I hope that you get to do this, to do this with your team, you know, when you go back to back to work, it's a really cool exercise. But my last um, little exercise I'd like you to do, and that is, you know, a little bit of reflection uh, that you can do after the session. That, and that is that if you, if you were a book, what would your book title be? And I'd like you to give that some thought, maybe... I have um, left my email address um, on, on the presentation. Perhaps you could email me. If you were a book, what would your title be? Thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, it really was cool to spend time with you and um, awesome to, to do this talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. I think you've left us with little gems of things um, for us to think about. And, you know, for us, who are so accustomed to being at Henley on campus, seeing students on a day-to-day -day basis. Henley is a high-touch environment. So whenever you walk around campus, we are always giving each other high fives. There are handshakes. We're giving each other hugs. Um, all appropriate, of course. But I think, you know, as Henley staff members, we are definitely missing that type of environment. And it's an environment that we are aware that we will not have for quite some time. But thank you so much, Dr. Zondre Kivi. Up next, we've got Francois Amageda. He is our next panel uh, member. Francois is the CEO and founder of Bokito Corporation. Bokito provides impact investment and organizational sustainability advisory services, as well as business development and market entry strategies into various sub-Saharan African markets. He is an adjunct faculty member and he is the program director on the PG Dip Africa program. Good morning, Francois. How are you? Good morning, uh, Lebo. I'm very well, thank you. And uh, thank you once again for giving me this opportunity to engage and uh, interact with uh, a virtual audience. Um, uh, as, you valued, as you mentioned earlier, uh, my name is Francois Amigide, uh, originally from Cameroon. And I'm a faculty member at Handy Business School. And what I'd like to do today or this morning is give you or the, um, the participant um, a brief overview of our PG Deep Africa program. Uh, the PG Deep Africa, uh, PG Deep Africa program was actually launched uh, last year, November, uh, and uh, has been a tremendous success on many levels. Uh, the level of engagement of students in class has been fantastic. We've had a phenomenal uh, lineup of, of, of faculty uh, who have really challenged the student to the core in appreciating and understanding business context or strategy uh, and uh, in, in the, within the African context. Um, the PGDF Africa is a blended program uh, with an African focus, as I mentioned. Um, which means that the learning will take place online as well as through contact time with lecturers. Um, it is an accredited uh, program, a postgraduate diploma program, uh, where a student will develop a similar skill sets as that, our, uh, as that of our mainstream program, but reframed for an African context. We have curated content for this program. Uh, which is rich and include literature on Africa's business environment, uh, African case studies, uh, thought-provoking document documentaries, and uh, this, the, this content is obviously led by facilitators with strong insights uh, into the continent of Africa. The goal is to equip uh, the participant uh, with the mental models, uh, I was listening uh, quite. I was listening quite attentively to Teboho and Zondre this morning, 
And uh, just to reinforce the, 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 the point that, uh, you know, we, we do challenge, men, we do challenge uh, perspective, we do challenge worldviews uh, in this program. Um, and so we will also um, equip the student with market intelligence and a new network that will potentially assist them uh, in the market expansion or business venturing ambitions. One thing for sure is that as students, you will be challenged. Um, I cannot overemphasize that point. Your mindsets and your beliefs about the continent of Africa will shift significantly and your mental model will be profoundly challenged. Uh, this we hope will give you a new identity as uh, engaged African citizens and agents of change. That's what we're trying to achieve. Okay, anyway, to give them, to, 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 give, to give the student an overview of the, of the, of the architecture. Uh, with regard to the program architecture, it will consist of four, it consists of four modules, each taught over 10 weeks. Uh, the first module is system management practice, is a system management practice, which includes strategy one, system thinking, and leadership one. Module two is the virtual immersion and action learning projects module, which includes leadership two, that focuses mostly on cultural intelligent, intelligence. And secondly, we have the African virtual immersion component with the use of virtual reality and augmented reality technologies to deep dive into business, into the business culture and social environment of some key frontier market in Africa. And this I think is quite revolutionary in the way uh, the program is being taught, uh, where we make use of these uh, exponential technologies to really give a near real experience to student on, uh, on some key markets in Africa. Module three is going to be about innovation wealth creation, and it will include strategy two, um, innovative wealth creation and leadership three. Module four is going to be about managing value stream and will include strategy three, managing value stream and leadership four. In addition to that, uh, participants will develop the African business project throughout the program. At the end of the day, we want to make this as practical as possible so that students can come away with something that is immediately implementable, whether it's an expansion strategy or plan into a new market in Africa or going and setting up a new business somewhere in Africa. Um, so with that, uh, I look forward to welcoming a number of you onto the program. The next intake will, uh, will, will be in April, uh, subject to confirmation by my boss, uh, Dr. Janet Brimmer. That's all for me. Thank you, Pronsa. Thank you so much. That was brief and to the point, and I hope that all the delegates have um, had a better understanding of what TG Dip Africa entails. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our info session a little bit earlier than we had anticipated, but I'm sure you are, um, you have no complaints with that as it frees up the rest of your weekend. Janet, if you can, in John's absence, just give us a short close off. Well, thanks very much to everybody who joined us this morning. I hope you found the conversation really interesting. And um, I hope that it's inspired you to rethink your, your, um, your goals for the future, uh, to rethink um, what uh, challenges you are going to be taking up in the next couple of months uh, and uh, maybe the next year or two. And I think perhaps the other thing is um, lockdown COVID has put us in a situation. We can bemoan the fact or we can take it as an opportunity to perhaps uh, rethink our lives. Uh, rethink what those goals that we've had on hold for so long. I know that things are hectic, but the news is, is things are always going to be hectic. So it's about grabbing, grabbing the opportunity um, while you can. Uh, if you are interested in the PGDIP or any other program at Henley, we are here to chat to you. Um, very happy to, to discuss. And um, I'd just like to leave you with a few final words, which is, don't give up studying. Don't ever give up studying. Um, whether it's formally or informally, keep studying, learning, 
um, and fully engaging with growth in your life. And I think that you'll find that that's invaluable. So again, thank you. And thanks to Kele, Kele Bojile. Thank you very much for um, leading the session today with such a plum. Um, and to uh, Francois, to Zandre, to Tabojo, thank you very much for uh, giving us your time this morning. Um, certainly lots to think about um, in two very different areas of thought. And um, I think uh, there's been a lot of value this morning. So that's just a little bit of an indication of what happens in our classes. Uh, because the Dean is present, uh, we didn't have as much fun um, this morning. Um, I'm just kidding, John. Um, so yeah, in our classes, very engaging and um, very caring um, and um, very thoughtful about each person's development, whether it's from faculty, the program director, the admin staff, or actually other people in the class that you actually learn a great deal from. So thank you very much. Um, I see a quick question by Ayanda about applying. We've got a website. Um, please contact Pranisha. Um, she's the one that looks after the PG Dip programs or contact any one of us um, uh, that you see here. Very, very happy to help you. All right, I think that's about it from us this morning, Kelly. Um, uh, just leaves me to say the final word is thanks to our Dean for spending an entire morning with us. Something about him is that he is always involved in all our programs and is always very keen to understand how people are learning and growing. So that's one of the differences about Henley. So thanks very much. And to our ops team, Graham, thanks for being there on your Saturday morning. Very much appreciated. And yeah, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. I loved all your questions. Would have liked it if there'd been even more. Um, but yes, hope, hopefully you've got a lot of thoughts going in your head now. Thanks very much, Kelly. Thank you so much, Janet. But most importantly, thank you to everyone that is online with us and spending the morning and just getting all those gems of knowledge. And I hope that we've been able to answer all your questions. Um, and also thank you to all our speakers, Dr. Janet Brummer, Mr. John Foster Pedley, Mr. Debojo Mehwe, Dr. Zondre Kivi, and Mr. Francois Amegide. Thank you so much for the time that you spent with us this morning. Goodbye.